happy Saturday. With everyone, we are happy to introduce the speaker of today, Mark Pedrin. Mark Pedrin is 13 years old and the son of Pastor Mike pa pa Pastor Michael Pedrin and <laughs> Shishma Pedrin. Mark Pedrin has been preaching since he was two years old and is now assisting Pastor Michael Pedrin in his digital ministry. He also shares two-minute reflections in their YouTube channel, Michael Pedrin. He loves to sing. He also loves to play the trumpet and guitar and also is a very good artist. But most of all, he loves Jesus. Mark, I have no other time to you. Uh, thank you for that lovely introduction. Well, you'll just have to bear with me because my virtual background didn't work at the last minute, so it's just a green screen. Uh, just give me a second while I share my screen. Uh, before we begin, let's just have a word of prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this wonderful Sabbath day of given us. Lord, now as we study your word, help us to understand that we are in the end of times and we don't have time to linger a lot, around a lot. Help us to start preparing and speak to me as I deliver your word, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. Well, my topic for today is entitled, We Are Nearing Home. Before I start, I would like to thank Pastor Daryl and Nutanana for giving me this opportunity to speak. And I would also like to thank God for giving me this opportunity to speak. Let me just start off with a story. In a small town, there lived a boy. He, he used to go, he, he was a normal boy. He used to like playing around and he had only a father. His mother died a few years back. He and his father used to like to go for a walk every evening and they used to chat with each other. And one day while walking, the father said, son, we are going to be shifting to a better town. So I'll be going there to do some preparations. And then the son asked, daddy, when will you be coming back? The father replied, son, when you see the road covered with snow, pack up because I'll be coming to take you there. Well, the story goes on, but I'd like to stop there. There's an interesting point there. Well, let me start with some facts. This world is filled with sorrow. It's filled with pain. It's filled with agony, suffering, and not many nice things. And people are trying to feel at home here. Well, definitely this world is not a good place to make your home. There will be a better place. And God has given us a promise saying that he will come and take us to that better place. John 14, two says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. God is telling us that we are going to go to a better place, a better home, but we have to be children of God to be there. But this earth is definitely not that better place because first of all, we don't live for eternity over here and there's a lot of suffering in this world. This is nowhere close to paradise. That place, that is the dream of our lives, that place filled with peace, joy, and happiness is heaven. And we are going to go to heaven if we choose Jesus as our savior. But we, we are inquisitive and we like to know the signs that when we'll be going to heaven. The same way the disciples asked Jesus, what shall be the sign of thy coming? and of the end of the world. Well, Jesus replied uh, by saying in verse six and seven, 
Ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom and against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. What Jesus said right there is the sign of the end times. So this is the sign of the end times. But the big question is, are we living in that end times? Are we living at the brink of Earth's history? Do we still have time to linger around? Well, let's do an investigation to see for ourselves if we are in the end time, or do we still have time to linger around and do stuff? Let's see the signs and see if it's coming to pass. First, it talks about wars. Let's study the sixth verse of Matthew chapter 24. It talks about wars and rumors of wars. Well, the last century has seen a lot of fighting and a lot of wars, like the two world wars, the war on terror, the Iraqi war, Kuwait being invaded, the Indo-Pakistan war, and so on. And there have been rumors of, rumors of a third world war. And weapons such as tanks, machine guns, artillery shells, explosives have killed millions of people. Well, definitely the first war, the first part of that verse is coming to pass. The first part of verse seven also says the same thing. Nation shall rise against kingdom and nation and kingdom against kingdom. Well, that is definitely coming to pass. It also talks about famines. In our recent years of this world, we have seen a lot of famine and starvation. I'm quoting from the Wikipedia. The Great Famine or the Great Hunger was a mass period, a period of mass starvation and disease in Ireland. During the famine, about one million people died and a million more immigrated. One million people died. That's a lot of fingers. You know, I mean, that's a lot of people. You know, your hand can count only to 10. If you have to count to one million, you will need 200,000 hands, and that's a lot of people who died and million more emigrated. Well, there have been many other famines such as the Bengal famine, and definitely famines are in our world and this sign has come to pass. Next, it talks about pestilences. Now, what is a pestilence? A pestilence is an epidemic according to the dictionary. And what's going on right now? The coronavirus pandemic or COVID-19 in chart. Uh, the coronavirus pandemic is a pandemic, which is an epidemic on a global scale. Another fulfillment of the signs that Jesus gave. And this was not the only epidemic. There have been many more like the bubonic plague, Ebola and a lot of bad stuff has happened in our planet. This thing has come to pass. Next, it talks about earthquakes. Now, did you know that the National Earthquake Information Center now locates about 20,000 earthquakes each year or approximately 55 per day? All was Jesus said in that verse is definitely coming to pass. God told Daniel in Daniel 12, 4, to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Many shall run to and fro, meaning there's going to be a development in transportation. And we definitely have come up in our modes of transportation from the cycle to the rocket. We have made amazing vehicles that travel at amazing speeds. And technology has developed rapidly. Now you tell me, which man before the 18th century would have thought that a press of a button could obliterate a whole city, yet we have developed nuclear bombs that can obliterate countries as a whole? Well, definitely knowledge has increased and 
there is people are really running to and fro. Well, that brings that sums up our investigation. We are definitely living in the end times. But wait, does this all help? Does knowing about earthquakes, pestilences, famines, and all these stuff help? Will you go to heaven by knowing these things? No, it will only tell you that Jesus is coming soon. Let me show you an example. Now, many of us rarely fly nowadays thanks to coronavirus, but suppose you were in 2015 and uh, you had a flight next month. These facts will only tell you that your flight is coming soon and you have to make preparations for your flight. It won't make the preparations for you. You have to make it yourself. And we all have to prepare for that flight to heaven. Nobody should miss that flight. And it's our duty to tell others to prepare for this flight. So how do we get ready for heaven? How do we prepare for that grand flight to heaven? I've just listed down a few of the many points. Let's see. Number one, keep in touch with God. Matthew 7, 22 to 23 says, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I'll just read the last line again. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, Jesus said that he will tell them that he never knew them and that them could be us too. So one way to get to heaven is to get to know God and to get to know Jesus. So how do we get to know God? Well, it's simple. We should just have a conversation to, with God. We must talk to him in prayer and pour out our hearts to him and he will hear our prayers. And it's also important to listen to God. Like, just imagine you're continuously talking to a friend and not letting him talk back. Well, that friend would get pretty angry. The same applies with your connection with God. I mean, you don't want to make God angry. And you could lose heaven by not reading his word. Like, if you want to know the truth, God would tell you to read his word, but you wouldn't listen. And at the end, God will say, I tried to tell you, but you didn't listen to me. So it is important to read God's word, as important as talking to him in prayer. Point number two, do his will. Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. It specifically says, he that doeth the will of my father. That means only people who obey God will enter into the kingdom of heaven. God doesn't want disobedient children in heaven. He wants all of us to obey him. And obedience to God comes with obeying the law of God and all 10 of it. Because if you break one, if you break one part of the law, you break everything. So let us all obey God fully. Point number three, don't cling on to the world. Well, uh, Matthew 9, 16 says, and behold, one man, uh, and behold, one came and said unto him, good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect, and if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell all that thou hast and give it to the poor, and you shalt have treasures in heaven, and come and follow me. Well, that was the rich young ruler who asked Jesus, and this was his expression. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, 
for he had great possessions. The rich young ruler loved God. He obeyed all commandments. He did his will. He kept in touch with God also. But he loved his possessions more than God. He gave up heaven for a few years of enjoyment on earth and missed eternal life for them. Well, if I was in his place, I would be rejoicing because it's like God telling me, son, you're all right. You've done everything correctly. There's only one more thing for you to do. Just one more step to enter heaven. And that is just go sell what you have, give it to the poor and follow me. I would be extremely happy because if I did that, my salvation was assured. But for many people, it's not like that. They love things of the world more than things of heaven. Uh, Mark 8, 36 says, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Well, you might be the richest man in the whole world, but if you love the riches that you have more than God, you will be going down with your riches at the end. It may not be riches. It could be something innocent like chocolate. Well, some people are addicted to chocolate, but whatever it is, it can be money, it can be friendship, it can be your job, it can be food. If you love anything of this world more than God, you'll have to finally go down with the world because you love the world. And if you love Jesus, you can go to heaven because we must not cling on to earthly things. Point number, uh, I don't know which number. Anyways, don't feel at home here. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. A popular verse, but every verse, if you read it properly enough, it can explain the whole gospel to you. Let's read it again in a different manner. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Well, you must be wanting to go to heaven, to go to heaven. Because if you're comfortable staying in this world, then you should stay in this world and you have no choice to burn with this world. Uh, Matthew 6.19 says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through, nor steal. Now this is important. For where your treasure is, there will your heart also be. Who is your treasure? Is it on earth? Is it in the bank? Is it in a restaurant? Well, your treasure is supposed to be in heaven because earthly things will perish. It will pass away sooner or later. But if you lay up your treasures in heaven, heaven is a safe place. It's a safe bunker. It's a safe bunker to keep your treasure in. And you have the assurance that your treasure will be safe up there. Heaven itself is a treasure and you must be wanting to go to heaven. So if your treasure is on earth, you will have to stay over right here with your treasure. Well, Jim Reeves got it right in his song. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Now, we should make our home in heaven. We're just passing through this world. It goes on. Oh Lord, you know, I have no friend like you. And we must keep Jesus as our best friend. We must have our treasures in heaven. Only then we can go there. Next, don't let trials discourage you. Well, this is one of the famous parables uh, that Jesus told. This is just a little bit about that. 
His master replied saying, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in a few things. Note, you have been faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Now, there's like a relation, what do you say, a ratio with this. If you are, if you are faithful in few things, you will be faithful in many things. The same way, if you are strong in few things, you will be strong in many things. And if you overcome small trials, you can overcome big trials. Now, we all go through trials in our life. It might be different for many people. I might be laughing at your trial and you might be laughing at my trial, but it's still a trial for each one. It's still tough to go through it. But with the help of Jesus, we must stand through it and we must face those trials and come out triumphant. We cannot do it on our own, but God will help us. He has given us the assurance that he will be with us and we must face all these small trials. It might be writing an exam on Sabbath. That might be a small trial for you, but if you don't stand for that trial, if you don't make a stand, and if you don't do the right thing, at the end, there's going to be a big trial. The, the world is going to tell you, you worship on Sunday or you die. You must have the courage to say, no, I will obey God. And you can only do that by facing these small trials that you face day to day. So be strong and be courageous. Face those trials with the help of Jesus. Next, choose your pride. Now, you might think that I made a spelling mistake and wrote the pride instead of sign. Well, no, I meant pride, but in a different sense, not self-praise, lifting up yourself. That's a different type of pride. I'm talking like, a lion type of pride. A group of lions is called a pride. Now, lions have always fascinated me. They look so majestic, powerful, and they have an amazing life system as well. And there's a lot we can learn from them. Well, no, I'm not gonna bore you by giving out facts about lions. I'll just bring out the values, the moral values that we can learn from these amazing beasts. Now, lions are ferocious, and when they fight, they really fight. But have you ever wondered, why do lions fight? What do they fight for? Well, they fight for their territory, and they fight for their children. Now, when two lions fight for territory, and the opponent wins and takes over the pride, it's called a pride takeover. And he becomes the new boss. He becomes the new father. And he becomes the head of the... Iba, Iba. Center, center. But when the, when the defender loses, he has to go away in ex exile. He's no longer allowed to stay in that pride. And the lionesses and cubs have a choice to accept that new leader or to go away in exile. Well, that's pretty amazing for such dull creatures compared to human beings to have such a complex life system. Revelation 5, 5 says, and one of the elders saith unto me, weep not, behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David hath prevailed to open the book and to lose the seven seals thereof. Revelation is describing Jesus as the lion of the tribe of Judah. It's a comparison to Jesus because Jesus is almighty, he's strong. And there's another reason also, because in 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is as a roaring lion which walketh about to seek whom he, he may devour. 
Now, the devil is also compared to a roaring lion, an angry lion. And we have all heard about the great controversy, the battle between Satan and Christ. And Satan is accusing Christ of not giving us the freedom. And there is a battle, a real battle, which is going on between Satan and Christ. Just think about it. Both of these leaders are compared to lions. And when lions fight, it's for a pride takeover. Now, earth is the battleground for Satan and Jesus. The fight is going on right here. There are millions of angels, holy angels and evil angels around us. Fighting for whom? Fighting for, our, for us. They are trying to convince us to join their side. It is our choice ultimately. Because just like how these lions work, when there's a pride takeover, the lionesses and cubs have a choice to stay with the new leader or to go away in exile. We have that same choice. We have the choice to choose Jesus or to choose Satan. We know nobody wants to choose Satan, but I'm telling you, it's easier to choose Satan than to choose Jesus. Just like that verse says, be sober, be vigilant. It says, be sober, be vigilant. Always be on your guard because the adversary, the devil, is as a roaring lion who walketh about seeking whom he may devour. There's a battle going on. And we can't just simply sit down and be spectators of this battle. We all are actively fighting in this battle. And we must choose our side. We must choose either the devil or to choose Jesus. The last point, have faith. Now, Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, we don't see Jesus coming. You can go outside. You won't see Jesus coming right now. But he is coming. How do we know? Because we have the evidence. Jesus has given us the signs. He's told us about these pestilences, famines, earthquakes, etc. And we can see it coming to pass. But what is the point of knowing all of that? What is the point of knowing all those things about earthquakes, all those things about famines, all those things about uh, pestilences, etc. Will it take you to heaven? No. We've just seen some of the ways to go to heaven. What is the point of knowing these ways to go to heaven if you don't believe in it? You might know everything. You might memorize the whole Bible. But if you don't have Jesus in your heart, if you don't understand it, it's all useless. We must believe, we must hope for, and we must wait for the second coming of Jesus. Because we're all going to heaven if we accept, accept him. And it's peace, joy, happiness forevermore. This life is miserable and it lasts only for a maximum of 100 years. And 100 years is nothing compared to eternity. Luke 21, 28 says, And when these things began to come to pass, then look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draw nigh. We all see these things coming to pass. We see the coronavirus pandemic. Hundreds and hundreds of people are dying. We can see the evidence. It's clear in front of our face. But many people are ignoring it. They say, it's a new normal. Life will go on. But no, life will make a drastic change to those who believe in Jesus. You have to make that choice to either go to heaven or stay in this world. At the end, this world will burn up. All your riches, you might have everything in this world. 
What's the point? You lose your own life if you don't accept it. Let us all believe. We are nearing home, friends. That beautiful day is drawing nigh. And we should not miss it. We should not miss it for anything in this world. Because eternal life is nothing compared to anything in this world. I believe Jesus is coming soon. And I'm doing my best to prepare for that great day. I hope you all are doing the same thing. We must not miss that day because missing that will be the greatest mistake of our lives. Let us all prepare for Jesus soon coming. Let us all be sober and let us all be vigilant. Come soon, Lord Jesus. Maranatha, thank you.